You said that Zelensky is the best president Ukraine has ever had. Yeah, I did. Do you stand by that? Well, okay, is there any way that you would be okay with this ending without regaining the territory that you've lost? There was basically like a small war in central Kiev between Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian government. At the same time, where like alarmed weapons, like <coughs> army, sort of, were trying to like prevent citizens from coming to the like parliament and there a lot of people were shot so in my case why we are brave enough to like fight for our own victory or for like changing our own government like mm. we can do that why you can't i was the first one who heard it like just some very weird sounds because my... how, how did you how did you get notified i mean was it the tv was it a s- no it's just sound <laughs> you, i didn't watch tv it's just the sound you hear like it's just like here so you hear like the bomb yeah you hear like a huge like sound of something is fucking going on sorry you're gonna beep it but like I don't know how to ask this in a good way, but were you not at home? Were it like your home might get like blown up? Like even now when I'm talking about it, I feel like all my body is like a bit shaking because yeah. of the adrenaline and in blood because you like feel it sort of once again. Welcome back everybody to another episode of the Athlon Honor Show. I am today joined by a very, very, very special guest. Kate Trofimova. Yeah. Did I say that right? Good. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it's the it's the Greek. It's How much time did you train to spell it? <laughs> to spell it? No, no, no. I pride myself on the accents. Um, but anyway, let's talk about let's talk about you uh, and why we're here. So um, I'll introduce you. Kate Trofimova is the CEO of Digital Imagination Group, a marketing agency that provides complex marketing solutions for business and personal brands. She's also served as a social media marketing manager in Kiev, a fashion journalist, including working as a media correspondent for the Ukrainian Fashion Week. And finally, she has worked as a model for over 10 years. Thank you so much. That's the long description. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I think our audience should know uh, what uh, an accomplished person you are. Thank you very much. So, yeah. Um, and today we are going to be talking about Ukraine. Um, But before we, oh, well, actually, before we get into questions, Kate, I understand that there is a uh, charity or an organization that you want to ask people to listening to donate if if they are interested. So do you want to say a couple words? Well, we'll turn to it at the end, but do you want to just briefly mention the name and we'll put it in the description as well? Yeah, so in short, when I was invited to the podcast, I wanted to combine it with the fundraising and I chose the company that my friends own. It is basically in Ukraine, but operates worldwide. It's called Tvori Dobro, which basically translates into like make good dates. And they painted the picture for me and it like drove all the way from Ukraine to Edinburgh. So we can present it to you and we can basically make a giveaway from all the donations you make and randomly choose someone who's going to win it. Awesome. 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 Okay. Um, and again, we'll, we'll say more about that at the end. But um, I want to, Kate, I want to just start by asking you uh, some fun questions that I kind of uh, pulled from doing a little bit of research on you. So uh, first off, you, you mentioned on your LinkedIn that you have many hobbies. Yeah. Can you, can you tell me a few of them? Well, basically, when I was a kid, I started from, from like dancing, like mm-hmm. ballet, jazz fan, mm-hmm. contemporary arts. I used to do uh, like drawing and painting. I used to, yeah. I actually like learning languages because in back school, I was learning like five languages, which wow. is Ukrainian, Russian, English, German, and French. Mm-hmm. And basically, I'm just the kind of person who gets used to a lot of things. So I'm trying to like keep me occupied. So I change hobbies yeah. a lot. Like I do. I used to do horse riding back home, okay. not that much anymore, like gym, stretching. Well, basically, I am like all in in all the adventures if I can. Awesome. Awesome. Can I ask you to move the mic just a tiny bit closer to you? Oh, closer. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, second thing, you said that you read over 60 books last year. Yeah. I was very bored. <laughs> <laughs> can you, can you tell me, uh, number one, what was the last book you read? And number two, what is the favorite book that you've read? 
Okay, so favorite book probably gonna be um, either The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene okay. or the book called The Women's City. I'm not sure whether it translated the right into English, but I was reading it in Ukrainian. Okay. So it's very like, it's by Elizabeth Gilbert, so it's like very two different genres. Yeah. Uh, last book, I think it was called Newport, Deep Work, but I'm still reading it. Okay. Is this is this predominantly nonfiction or fiction? Uh, both. Both. So like, uh, 40s laws of power is more about like s- s- capitalism sort of stuff. Yeah. But like, I'm considering it like a conscious capitalism. Um, Elizabeth is like novelist more, but yeah. she like writes in a very good genre. But it's like more of like romance book. And deep work is uh, nonfiction. Right. Right. Yep. Okay. And then finally. Your motto is think big, dream big, do big. Yeah. What does that mean? And why should other people try to incorporate it into their Well, it's just my belief in terms of like, if you want to succeed in life, in anything you do, like you need to first of all dream about it. So be passionate about what you do. Second of all, like measure your success and do the goals and like achieve your goals and like track your progress, Mm -hmm. which means like do big. And like, uh, think big is about like having a big scale and like thinking and like looking long term. So like, not see only what you have right now on the short term goals and like look what you can like succeed over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. why. <laughs> very nice. Very nice. Um, okay, let's let's get into your life, okay. shall we? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, born in Kiev. Yep. Yeah. Is your family also from Kiev? Yeah. So, my both parents are from Kiev. My actually grandfather uh, is from Carpathian Mountains. Okay. So, I was very surprised when I like knew that I have like around 30 siblings from like second, third generation sort of, which was very fun. But mainly my family is from Kiev. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, and where? So, the Carpathian Mountains. Yeah. For people who are not good at geography, where where are we talking? So it's like Western Ukraine, right? Uh, like the Western, the most Western part you can actually find almost. So like, so near it's Poland, a hu- huh? So yeah. like near Poland. So it's it actually takes like a huge part, like, and it's not only the Ukrainian territory, but I think people should know it. it's like a basic geography. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> we'll put a map on on the screen. Yeah, but it's actually quite famous for skiing in the winter, so word well, not only Ukrainian wise, so. All right. Probably some All people right. skied there. And and you mentioned, so you had, was it 33 cousins? In- uh, approximately. I don't even know all of them. So it's just what yeah. grandfather told me when he was telling me like some stories from his childhood. Yeah. And I don't even know all of them. Mm. just know some of them. Like close family, some part of extended family, but not to that extent. Yeah. Would you say that you're generally kind of close with your extended family, like grandparents, uncles, aunts, or... Well, with grandparents, for sure, I don't have any aunts or uncles because okay. my parents don't have any brothers or sisters. But with my like family, I am like it's very funny because like those who do like blog or any social media, they know how like your family if they are on social media, they like react on everything you do, like comment, post, yeah, like react on your every stories you post. So what my grandfather does, he has like a smartphone, yeah. So he literally like comments on my stories and be like, I don't really understand what did you write in English, but that's cool. <laughs> So I would say pretty close. I'm trying to call them at like at least once a week. That's very like, nice. And they're still in Ukraine. Yeah. So my grandparents still in Kiev in the country house right now. Uh huh. And my grandfather on father's side is in Germany right now. In Germany. Yeah. He moved after the the full scale invasion. So he's there with some of his relatives. Nice, nice. And so, how long have you been in Edinburgh now? It's actually in two days. It's gonna be anniversary of me being two years in UK. But okay. I started from like England, and I moved to Edinburgh like one and a half year ago. So, getting used to. <laughs> <laughs> do you miss? Do you miss uh, home in in Kiev? I do, just because the mentality of people and basically like social culture is very different. Yeah. Like. I don't have any issues with like English or like communicating, but generally speaking, like I probably you would experience the same even though you're from New York. Like yeah. if you moved here, people are different, like than every city in the yeah. country. So like 
For example, I told you that all Ukrainians are very straightforward. Yeah, you did and say that. And here it's not at all like a culture of speaking. Like yeah. people consider it being straightforward like being rude. And for me, it's very uncomfortable because uh, I know that if I can write like five word email, I will just send it kind of email instead of like being polite for like hundred words or something. Yeah. See, I think I think here I overcompensate for the formality because I'm like I had that in the back of my because in New York, you just people just like yell at you like <laughs> and like but like in in not like they're mad at you but it's like when they want you to know something they'll just like doesn't matter who you are they'll just like say it directly to mm -hmm. your face um but here I, i feel like i have to yeah like dance around and be like oh dear blah 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 blah, blah. you know i hope you, um just a very formal like email yeah. process uh and communication so i feel like i overcompensated okay Uh, it's actually very interesting why like i never i never really understood that i was trying to figure out like historically wise why that like this way but i never really got it because like even word well you see like italy spain like like central europe they all are more like emotional anyway yeah but well it's 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 interesting i was talking about this on an, an earlier podcast but the okay. the warmer countries tend to be <laughs> warmer <laughs> tend to be warmer and, and the colder countries tend to be a little bit like hands to themselves you know when you greet them it's like you just kind of stand here and um it's interesting why that kind of developed that way mm -hmm. but i was in kazakhstan not that a long time ago and it's it's relatively quite cold that's true if you know that's like true. the climate in there and people are still very friendly like very friendly yeah if you have ever been like in uzbekistan or kazakhstan or I've, like, I, to be honest i've never been to kazakhstan should, or uzbekistan should. Um, I would love to go to Georgia. That is a country because okay. I I adore Georgian food. There's only one place in Edinburgh, Hungry Wolves. That's it. I never found any other restaurant really? here. Did you? I uh, no, no. Yeah. I mean, I've I most of the Georgian food I've had is either abroad or in New York. But I'm a big big fan. Me too. Um, it's very underrated. It is. I cannot agree with that more. It's a very underrated food. Have you ever tried Ukrainian food? I have, I have. Uh, there's a couple um, Ukrainian restaurants in New York. Okay. Yeah, there's actually a, a Ukrainian. Um, so we have like uh, a town, which is called um, Bright. Uh, it's called like Little Odessa. Really? <laughs> yeah, um, but it's it's basically for. All people who immigrated here to the U.S. from former Soviet Union countries. Mm -hmm. So you have like Ukrainians, you have Russians, you have. Um, It's like little Eastern Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but then there's a separate area which is smaller, but that is only Ukrainian. And there's like a Ukrainian primary school there. Uh, there's Ukrainian supermarkets. There's like Ukrainian restaurants. I, I have one more reason to visit New York. You have to visit. <laughs> you have to visit. Um, Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm just distracting you from your questions. But, no, no, no. Uh, but I'm this kind of person. I just fly towards the topics. Yeah. So when you get it into your mind. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, so where were we? Yes. You grew up in Kiev. Mm -hmm. What What do you remember most about kind of the early days of your childhood growing up there? I mean, take me through the the early life when you were you're a young person, uh, you know, just a, a child growing up in Kiev. What was that like? Well, first of all, I would say that I would, I always say that I was the happiest child in the world because yeah. I had the best childhood I could ever had. Yeah. Some people would say I had spoiled childhood. I'm not going to disagree on that, but I grew up with my parents uh, in the countryside, mm -hmm. first of all, until the time I was gone to school. Mm -hmm. And I would say... I had everything I needed, like mm -hmm. financially wise, health wise, friend wise. I was very sociable always. And my parents were like caring and very like supportive of me. They were working a lot though. But I think it gave me like a very huge stimulus in the future to mm. like to work towards the same goal sort of. Because like I actually remember my early life either with like mom's office or in the country that house. Yeah. 
because it was really fun because I think that's why actually I become like founder of the company in here just because like I grew up with a mentality of like you gotta like do something big yeah. when you grew up yeah. so this was my early life and when if we're talking about like more sad subject when the first Maidan happened and the crime like the annexure of the Crimea I was still very young so I didn't really understand yeah. what was going on so it's like it was like a small bubble in central Kiev that I would say like and children was just taken away from there so you were not really like seeing what's going on only like through television but only when you grew up you understand everything can we um just, Slow it down. <laughs> we'll just go back briefly to the because I'm, I'm i'm interested yeah. in the countryside mm -hmm. um it was that like a, a suburb of kiev is that it's not like a, a basic expression of like a town there's like different different sorts of imagination of the countryside it could be like a grandma countryside we all imagine can be like that as well or it can be like newly built houses it was semi newly built houses okay. that my grandparents built but it was like quite big sort of with the garden and they even built the swings in there <laughs> for oh, me wow. yeah so there is two type of the countries okay if you saw any like Soviet Union uh, films about countryside, it's like the first option, and the second option is like about more modern situation. How like we have like a residence complex just outside. Okay, I mean, so you grew up in the you grew up in the countryside until you went to school. Yep. Um, what age was that roughly? Like seven. Seven. Aged, yeah. And so, so what is what are most not to generalize too much, but what do most young people do uh, for like fun? In, I mean, what is a typical kind of range of activities that young people have in in Kiev? Is it is it just like everywhere else, or is it something you think unique? Well, I would not say that there is some like crazy secret behind <laughs> like children time spent after school, <laughs> but. Um, I would say that I didn't really have that much time to like spend with the classmates because like I had swimming, I had like you swim. Yeah, I used mm. to, not anymore. Yeah, because it's me swimming well. is very like boundary mm -hmm. sport. You like need to do stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. like when I someone know. tells me what to do. So it, I used to do it just for like fun. Um, but like I had a lot of hobbies because my school was like from eight o'clock to five o'clock. Yeah. So it's like like a full-time job yeah. Yeah. and after that i was doing like dancing or singing i used to do singing as well and i was coming home like around 10 o'clock at wow. night to do my homework so it was really like not so you slept good each night huh you slept good each night i did i definitely yeah did. so it's more of like occupancy wise like hobbies i think it's actually something that like di like differentiates ukrainian countries from like for example uk as well because like in Ukraine, we always have like a very strict schedule for all the kids. Yeah. So like, school hobbies, like extra lecture activities, like essential. You won't have like kid who doesn't like mm. do the same kind of routine. Yeah. What about? I mean, so was there anybody in your family that you think was? I mean, obviously your parents, but anybody outside of your parents that kind of made a big impact on you, even today. Well, I would not really say so besides my mom, but it's parents as well, because I spent a lot of time with her at her work because she was like a right hand of like a huge corporation and they yeah. were working on like real estate and she was basically like had like, I don't know, responsibility of ruling 200 people sort of. Yeah. And when I was a kid, I used to spend all the time in her office and like looking at that i was like this is something i would want to become yeah but it's the, i think this was the only role model i really had beside that i always had like the mindset of like i am admiring myself in the future so like my role model would be me yeah. like 10 20 years you were you were a very uh, deep thinker as a child i know but i like this kind of like bigger thinking of things to make it more meaningful you know yeah yeah that's uh I think you'd be in the the top one percent of children in that. I'm regard. sure you also had yeah. like uh, strife or like controversial things. And no, when I was a kid, I wanted to be first. I wanted to be a baseball player. 
Okay. Do you know baseball? Yeah, but I never watched it. It's very big in, in New York. Um, then I wanted to be uh, like an American football player. Um, and then I just didn't know what I wanted to do until much later on. So you're way ahead of me in that regard. I think just the concept of like what differentiates Ukrainian children into like other countries who yeah. just grew up faster. Yeah. Probably yeah. due to like work conditions as well. But mainly we just get like this concept of responsibility and living separately from parents earlier on. So like here people like understand what they really want to do in life around like twenty five years old sort of. Mm. Or more sometimes, or they move out from parents or like from like yeah. roommates at that time. But in our country, like if you're 22, if you don't know what you're gonna do, it's like really <laughs> you don't know. You should know. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. What about traditions? Traditions. As a kid, do you have any traditions? We you actually have, have a lot of traditions. But if we talk about like basically, if we go back like years ago, there is a lot of traditions we have. But in like modern world, we don't follow all of them mm. but i would say like some interesting traditions are like for example easter we Pascha. celebrate yes we celebrate Pascha actually on sundays this sunday yeah yeah greek people do too <laughs> yeah and like all world celebrated it like a month ago already sort of so like we have huge differentiations in terms of like celebrations to do the eggs yeah, so like competition? we color. Yeah, and we have like I don't know I don't know why people don't do that. We have like axe competition where you like color your own eggs and then yep. you like fight them. them. You yes. frag them. And when I was a kid, I like bought like a metal egg that looks like <laughs> a real one, <laughs> and I was like, I'm a big boss here. <laughs> That was fun. But we also like bake pasta itself. Who doesn't know pasta is like bread with like some ingredients inside of it, which takes like 20 hours. 20 hours. Minutes. Like, yeah, it's crazy. That's why I, m I made it myself only once. It was mm. the first and the last time I did it. But, <laughs> it. but it was really interesting. And it's very sad that you cannot find it here. Like I was trying to find pasta here to like buy it on the shop. They don't sell it. So the only way to do it, I like found the kind of like baker who does it. And he's going to ship it to you. No, it's in Edinburgh, but it's oh. like Ukrainian girl okay. who, woman actually, but she makes amazing like pasta cakes. Mm. But this is the only way you can get it. You cannot just last minute go to shop and be like, I need it. It's just like long term. And we also always go to like church on the past as well yeah. to like use the saint water on the food we eat. Saint water. Yeah, it's just the water from the church. Yeah, yeah, we I know, call I know. It saint water, you know. But yeah, because I'm Orthodox Christian. Yeah. And my family, all of my family as well, as most Ukrainians are, uh, so we like sort of follow these kind of traditions. And um, yeah. How do you okay. say? Um, the equivalent of Christ has risen in Ukrainian. Christos narodivse, abo Christos vaskres. Okay. Like there's two options. Okay. In um, in Greek, you say Christos anesti. Okay. Which literally means like yeah, Christ has risen. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the response like Christos anesti, which is like, indeed, he's risen. Okay. We also have this kind of like saying in Pascha, you say like Christos was Christ, Vaistino was Christ. It's like in a common communication. You have yeah. like and all the relatives call you usually and you have the same communication with all of that, but it's fun. Like it's sort of bounding. Mm. And actually one thing I also found very interesting, like when I moved here, I saw like that all people like wear like for example like red wedding ring on the left hand. In Ukraine we wear it on the right hand. And I don't know why. I was trying to figure it out as well. And this just says it's like it goes back to like old times when this tradition was born from Romans and stuff. But like it's very weird. Like there's only like Eastern countries, some of them yeah. wear it on the right hand. How did you notice that? Well, I moved here and I saw people. <laughs> and I was like, why do you wear it on the left hand? They were like, because. It's like, okay. Mm. It's just interesting. I'm trying to notice the cultural differences. This is something that was like. Very attentive to, to details.
Well, at the same time, when, for example, I go out somewhere and yeah. like I sometimes wear like rings like on the left hand because I don't wear it on the right hand because yeah. the wedding rings are for me in my head. But people here like ask me, are you married? And I'm like, <laughs> no, <laughs> why? And that's how you understand like this kind of thing that are interesting. Different. Interesting. What about, um, do you have any like national holidays that you do traditions for? Yeah, we have like the Victory Day. We have, uh, well, basically all fasts that are celebrated here, we also have them, but in different dates sometimes. And some national celebration like Victory Day. Um, mm. I'm probably not going to remember all of them, but we have. Yeah, them. yeah. It's actually fine. a bit complex for me. That's fine. Yeah, it's just, I would just celebrate them. And then I like when it comes up to it, we do. Okay. I'm going to move to kind of less uh, happier subjects let's put okay. it that way um so uh when you were a kid staying with childhood did you did you think at all about that like uh next door was was russia who was like a threatening country uh did that ever like when you were young young like elementary school did you ever process that well, when I was in elementary school, I never had, like, understand the concept of, like, war itself to that extent. Yeah. Like, you, like, read the books and you understand it was, like, old times ago, like, in the 18th and 16th centuries. And you don't really understand that it could happen now or it actually is happening right now yeah. when you were a kid. And talking about, like, Russia, the Ukrainian situation when I was a kid's kid, like, I was going, for example, to Egypt or Turkey and... Like, for example, my family was, like, introducing me to some people who they met there. Yeah. And they were, like, Russians, for example. It was, like, back before 2014. And you never really understand that, like, people can make a threat to you. When you, like, speak to, like, another 10-year-old, you're right. like, cool. Right. Sort of. You don't really understand that. But after some while, when it became, like, bigger on the global scale mm -hmm. it's actually very upsetting that when it just started not even like all ukrainians really paid that much of attention to it like not all of them knew it like mm -hmm. basically like kids talking ways like parents did of course mm -hmm. but they didn't put it on the same scale as it put, is put now so like one upsetting fact is that like people think that like war started in ukraine in 2022 which is fair but not really because it started in 2014 right. like Crimea and actually so like people don't understand that it's like long-term process that just not happened one day right but when I was a kid I didn't fully understand it because like parents protect you from it yeah. like they don't really start talking to you like oh this happens mm. because like it's far away sort of because Kiev is like central Ukraine sort of even, right like ish let's say and it was in eastern Ukraine, in like Donetsk region, for example. And when you're a kid, you don't fully understand it. Because, for example, I've never been in Donetsk. So if someone would tell me like about that, I would be like, okay, where exactly is it? Because mm. when you were six, you don't really like concerned about it to that extent. Yeah. Was was there a mo like you mentioned uh, the annexation of Crimea. Yeah. Uh, was there a point where you're like, not like an oh crap moment, but like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, like it kind of hits you as like, it's possible that this could happen to us. I think it was when I was just asking my parents why we cannot go to like a particular part of the city. Mm -hmm. Because at that time they started like a lot of revolutions in Ukraine, basically in major cities in Kyiv as well. And people were protesting towards like government. They don't do anything about it. Yeah. And... That point, you really start understanding when it happens in like in your city. Yeah. Like when you understand something is wrong, and I just was trying to ask my parents, but it's it's very weird feeling because like if someone has kids, they know that kids ask like millions of questions every day, and yeah. sometimes these questioners are like, "Oh, is this person dad or stuff like that?" Like right. you don't really know how to answer <laughs> to this question, right? Yeah. So like I was asking these kind of questions, and my parents was trying to like explain it to me, but not in a way of like harming my like a seven year old brain. Yeah. So this is the moment I understand that there's something happening, but like not to the like oh crap moment. It's yeah. more of like okay, it's not great. Yeah. So 
when you grew up, it's slowly just starting like being more noticeable. For example, in my school, there were a lot of kids from Donetsk moved to my classroom. Yeah. And then like they start telling you some stories. They start like sharing that. But at the same time, you would never say any difference because this kid doesn't look like a traumatized kid who are like, spend their times in the shelters when they were like 10 they're mm. like absolutely normal kids so sometimes it's controversial mm. what about uh did you have any stories or kind of um things that either relatives or friends or ancestors told you about things that had happened like ways that kind of major events had affected their lives like for holodomor or the um World War Two, or you know the the uh, Maiden Revolution. Like, was there any stories that you have, or like just either pre uh, collapse the Soviet Union kind mm -hmm. of stories? That I think what uh, I think as every family in Ukraine will have their stories. Like, my family was not like harmed to that extent as a lot of people okay. did. But, like, I think during the Holodomor, it, like, a lot of people did, even my family. And, like, I think that's why we have a tradition in Eastern Europe that you are not allowed to eat, like, food on the plate. So, like, you need to finish what you eat. Really? Yeah. Because, like, it, during the Holodomor, a lot of, like, 99% of the population didn't have anything to eat besides, like, potato right. that you ate, like, during the months, months and that's it. Yeah. So, that's why when you come to, like, my grandparents as well. Like, they're trying to feed you. This is the concept of Eastern European, like, we are trying to feed you as a concept of, like, we're trying to care for you because my grandparents didn't have enough food for a long while during the Holodomor. And that's the way they show they care. And mm. this is something, like, that I understood in when I grew up as well. Because yeah. you don't understand it when you're a kid. Did you, did you learn about, like, those events in school? Like, were those taught, like, to you? Yeah. Well, one of my favorite subjects in school was history. Okay, so me too. During, yeah, really? Yeah. Okay. So during history classes, you start to understand more and talking to your family. But originally, like, I would say that fully you understand everything that happened even during the time you were born already when you, like, grew up. And yeah. you can fully, like, be responsible how you react on it. Because, yeah. like, everyone trying to support you and, like, protect you. Because when you're 10, you cannot really, like, influence on it fully. Yeah. So, this is it. And a lot of people, when I was in Ukraine in September, I visited Ukraine for four days. Like, I would say people are just tired. But at the same time, they are not, like, losing hope or losing their optimistic mindset or losing their, like, stories that they had. Mm. which was very interesting for me because sometimes when you look on the news and people think like everything is so horrible, like, etc. It is, but at the same time, you see how people are trying to like go through it and pretend that everything is okay. So you can like go to work, have electricity, have water, etc. Because there's a lot of like, for example, like electricity shortcuts that you don't have like water or electricity for like entire day or mm. for two days. Mm -hmm. So... It's inter it was interesting for me how like people are adapting to yeah. new circumstances, even though it's like crap, <laughs> originally speaking. Yeah. Hmm. What about, um, you mentioned the annexation of Crimea mm -hmm. and the, the Maidan revolution and the war in Donbass. Do you have any, uh, do you have any like friends or, or, do you have any stories, uh, oh, personal yeah. stories from that that people have told you or if so, you were affected in any way? I have a story of my assistant. She works with me on the marketing company and I prepared, like, I asked her to write her story for me so I can read it to you. And I'm going to try to find it right now so we can, like, basically get to know more from her story than from mine because she's originally from, like, Donetsk. And she was the one who like experienced basically two wars in Donetsk when she right. was forced to move to Kiev, and then now. So for people that don't know, right, there was um, the Russia annexed Crimea. Yeah. And then following that was a war in the Donbass region, yeah. which is the the easternmost part of Ukraine. They're great at history. Yeah, I should probably clarify that. You're right. <laughs> Sorry. So. My PA is named Lila, 
and she write her so I'm just gonna write read it to you so I don't like miss important parts of it. So she said the first shocking event as I remember now was when Crimea was annexed. I remember how my whole family was sitting in my grandmother kitchen when the news broke. I was still a child and I didn't quite understand what could it mean. But from my mother's experience, I realized that I would somehow affect our lives. We used to go to Crimea every summer and losing it was very painful for me. At the same time, we all watched with fear the events on Maidan, learning every day about the situation of relatives in Kiev. And a few months later, the war began. At that time, everyone thought it would end in a few weeks. However, it stopped going to school because my parents didn't want me to study in the basement and we moved in with my grandmother to a safer area. And after an explosion awoke us at night, we decided to go to the seaside for a couple of weeks just to get through this event. But after the end of whole weeks, it became clear that the conflict wouldn't resolve so quickly and we went to Kyiv to stay with relatives for a short while. Uh, relatives sent us to our things, sent us our things by post, and we started a new life from scratch in the capital, Kiev, hoping to return home for a few more years, and then losing even that hope. So going to seaside, I found myself in another city without the possibility of returning home and seeing a part of myself and my family once anymore. So basically, what this story is saying that. It started from Crimea when we all used to go to like summer holidays. Yeah. And then to the Donetsk region where it like became sort of the same as it began in 2022 for all of us. But it began in like Donetsk in 2014. And basically she experienced the same situation we all experienced in 2022 but earlier on. And I think like it's important to understand that this trauma never really goes away. Like... Because when war started in 2022, I was not sleeping that time. It was like 5 a.m. And like some things just change like forever. Or you cannot really fully express what you feel because like it's just a shocking experience. Like you cannot really explain to like people, for example, when some of your family dies, you cannot explain how do you feel it just because like it's just something you're trying to be positive to the most possible extent you can. But at the same time, like stories you hear daily, it's just crazy. Like how population of Ukraine decreased within like these two years, how people like ran away, the stories of people who like lose their like grandparents and like some of their pets as well or kids as well. Like the story that happened with the supermarket, I'm not very sure whether it's shown here or not, but like Within one day, one huge supermarket in Ukraine was bombed and like around like a thousand people just died within like two, three days, four days. Wow. So, and just some stories that you don't really hear out there or if you like search for them. Yeah. But I'm happy that I didn't like experience all of it on myself, that my family is safe to the most possible extent. But it's just, People need to realize how serious it is because recently I saw a reel basically on Instagram where like there was a like reporter. He was like filming the situation in Kiev and on his phone, but at the same time filming what is like on the TV. And basically he was saying like, oh, in TV, they're saying to you that everything is so horrible, but people in central Kiev are fine. They're like walking outside and they're, yeah, but like, do you understand, like, sometimes you have, like, 100 mis missiles, like, over Kiev at night, mm -hmm. and, like, you cannot really sleep. And at the same time, yeah, we have a protection, and Kiev is more protected than other cities, but you never know what's going to be tomorrow. Like, mm -hmm. this is what upsetting point is. So, like, we are trying to be positive about <laughs> what we have right now, but at the same time, people need to understand that nothing is over at all, and we're just trying to, like, keep up with, with what we're having at the same mm -hmm. time. Do, do you think... I don't know how closely you're following like the UK media coverage of it, but do you feel like um, there are substantial differences in the UK media coverage of what's happening versus what's coming out of Ukraine, like what Ukrainian media is reporting? I would say that UK media is one of the best media that we like, if you compare with within the countries, like UK is trying to highlight as much as possible. And 
basically UK was one of the first countries who like suggested hostage to Ukrainian citizens. Uh, but at the same time, I think on the global scale, a lot of Ukrainian news being like cut just because there is like Palestine, Israel war at the same time. Like there is a lot of experiences we had in our daily life that like catch this like screen time. So you cannot actually feed everything in it. But I think over time, people just get used to. Yeah. I will actually like tell you about one book I recently read that really correlated with my mind about like what's going on right now. But if we are like comparing the news, I would say one of the like sad things that I saw, like for example, Ukrainian film, 20 Days in Mariupol, it won Oscar. Did you know yeah, about yeah. it? Yeah. So basically, one of my friends was like in the team who was like on the stage and uh, when they were filming like their speech about like how they're excited that they won the Oscar and they were talking about like Ukrainian war. Because Zelensky was not allowed, for example, to speak on Oscar if he wanted to, but they didn't allow it because it's out of politics. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like, we were having a speech there. Like, they were having a speech there about, like, five minutes, like, general average time for, like, explaining how they won the category, why is it important for them, why this film is, like, very important to see because you really understand how much Mariupol is, like, yeah. happening. And... It's actually sitting in Ukraine as well, not that far from Donetsk, just for those who don't understand, in eastern Ukraine. And, like, they cut almost all of it. It was, like, only, like, 10% of 100% of the speech, wow. like, the director was talking. Just And Disney explained, like, who was, like, hosting thing, Disney. And they said, like, oh, our screen time was too long. We needed to cut it, guys. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, like last year, when the film about Navalny won, yeah. probably you know about Alexander Navalny as well, it's like sort of the opposition of like Putin, at least to some extent. There is a lot of controversial thoughts about him as well, yeah. but sort of opposition. Like when his wife got the like award, his, her speech was like full on screen <laughs> last year. This is what really like sometimes <laughs> annoys me. In that particular speech that you mentioned, the Oscar speech, do you remember like kind of the substance of what was cut out? Or it's okay if you don't. Well, I didn't watch Oscar live. So basically the speech was heard only during like live stream, yeah. but on the like recorder and yeah. recording it was cut. So basically they were just saying how were they filming Mariupol? Because like Mariupol, the city like Kharkiv as well, it was a city that was like almost was fully bombed. Right. I have friends from Mariupol. And, like, their story is even, like, harder to, like, even imagine because, like, there is no city at all. There is, like, a couple of buildings that were left. Right. And, like, they were filming this, like, it's like documentary, basically. Right. And filming about how, like, people's stories, how they were, like, filming to film itself. Like, that's hard to film when you have, like, you need to go to the shelter all the time. How, like scary it is and like how ukraine needs support for the skill like the people to understand what's going on and they cut it this mm. part they cut it like this is very sad because i understand like like eurovision as well they are trying to stay out of politics but at the same time it's almost impossible right now to stay out of politics yeah yeah this is the first oscar in the ukrainian history And I'm honored, I'm honored. But probably I will be the first director on this stage who will say, I wish I would never made this film. I wish to be able to exchange this to Russia, never attacking Ukraine, never occupying our cities. <laughs> to I wish to give all the recognition to Russia not killing tens of thousands of my fellow Ukrainians. I wish for them to release all the hostages, all the soldiers who are protecting their land, all the civilians who are now in their jails. But I cannot change the history. I cannot change the past. But 
we all together you i'm on i'm on you some of the most talented people in the world we can make sure that the history record is set straight and that the truth will prevail and that the people of Mariupol and those who given their lives will never be forgotten because cinema forms memories and memories form history so there was kind of two the first date was in November 2021 mm -hmm. right when Russia started to um, like amass troops on the border and then the second one was obviously February 24th. Yeah. Um, can you kind of take me through what was going through your mind first, kind of when Russia started amassing troops, and then what went through your head morning of February 24th? Well, if we're talking about 2021, it was not that, that publicly sort of announced because the... Um, government of ukraine they were trying to like sort of keep like nation in safe and yeah. in peace so not trying to make like a riot all around that so it was not really that like seen in the news all around yeah. and they were trying to like minimize the importance of it so when i just saw that news it was like okay this is weird hopefully everything's gonna be okay everything's mm. gonna be all right we're gonna be fine like it's just sort of like you're trying to like deny what's going on. Right. Like it's just first stage of like acceptance what's going on. And then everything sort of calmed down. And people were like, some people were saying like, um, it was going to be fine. Like there's not going to be a war, full scale war, because there's already war in Donetsk. Like we're already fighting there. It should not be like full scale. Like everyone was saying like, it's going to be okay. Some people were like dramatizing, we're going to all die tomorrow. Like everything's going to be very bad. So you're like, Basically, you're trying to believe that everything's going to be fine. Yeah. You don't really want to, like, believe that everything's going to be to that extent as it's in, like, eastern Ukraine. Yeah. So, that was the first reaction. Okay. But if you're talking about 21st February, it was, um, it was actually time I didn't, I was not sleeping that night. I don't know. I was just um, probably, like, doing some studying or working. I don't really remember. Mm. But it was at mom's, my, my mom's house. I was living that time with my mom uh, during the winter. And, like, I was the first one who heard it. Like, just some very weird sounds. Cause my how, how, did you, how did you get notified? I mean, was it the TV? Was it a No, siren? it's just sound. <laughs> you, I didn't watch TV. It's just the sound you hear. Like, it's just like... My mom lives not far from the airport. There okay. is two airports in, in Kiev. One is, like, sort of... City, not that far from city and other one is far from city my mom lives near the one that is not far from city or at least used to live and uh i was staying there so what are the first things people are trying to destroy is like airports, airports. yeah so this is where you hear so you hear like the bomb yeah you hear like a huge like sound of something is fucking going on sorry you're gonna beep it but like you don't we're, really we're uncensored okay we are uncensored <laughs> but this is just Crazy, you don't understand what's going on. And you're yeah. like, I was I was going to my mom like, is it okay? And it happens often or like, did something going on? Yeah. And then she was like, what? And then like, we woke up and like, we had just opened the news and we're like, the war started. And this was, this was at five in the morning? Yeah, five, six o'clock in the morning. <sighs> well, it actually started at like four, but I heard it at five. So. I mean, do you remember what was kind of the initial like the initial reaction reaction when you like realized i mean because i imagine like when you first hear that sound you don't understand it you're thinking what is going on yeah right and then kind of a period from that to when you kind of internalize i think i would not say that i still fully understand it because it's a long-term process especially i know myself that i i react on traumas like long term like that i'm trying to block it to the extent of i can like fu function normally so like i don't get out of my routine like mm. i'm trying to like be as cold as possible about everything 
because otherwise I just know I'm just going to be like de- depressed and like panic all the time. Mm. So still to this day, I'm trying to understand it. But initial reaction, it was like denial. And I would say like just adrenaline. Like even now when I'm talking about it, I feel like all my body is like a bit shaking because yeah. of the adrenaline in my blood because you like feel it sort of once again. But I was just trying to like make everyone peaceful because everyone were panicking because I have a like younger brother and my mom and I was, I was just trying to be like, okay, what are we going to do? She was like, okay, we should go to the basement. And uh, we couldn't because there was issue with the water supply. So like the water tube was broken. So the Mm. like underground was flooded. So we couldn't go to the underground. So we were like in the in the bathroom, just like in the like huge bathroom where you can like stay and try to be like protected. And we were just reading the news. Yeah. And for like first couple of days that were was happening. And I think after that while for like until the moment I actually got out of Ukraine, I was like still in the like moment of like not fully understanding what's going on. Because you're just you're just trying to be like sarcastic about it, and you're trying to like adapt, and you're just trying to call your friends and be like, "Are you in Israel?" I have a friend from Israel, mm. and she's like, "Yeah, I'm in Ukraine. How are you doing? I'm not great. How are you?" It's like, "I'm not really great as well." <laughs> so this kind of communication and like, it's hard to accept it fully, yeah. and only when you like get out of it, I started like more like feel it on my skin when I get out of there so I can like breathe like freely and don't wake up every night Mm. from like the sirens and the alarms probably to some people it's gonna sound very weird like how you cannot understand it if it's like going on out there but this is like just the reaction of the organism how you like react if you are stressed yeah and if your body cannot like sort of handle the stress you are in so this is sort of the reaction a lot of people get I read that you spent four days driving 2,000 miles from Ukraine to England Yeah. after the war. Can you... I mean, I can't imagine. That's... Um, well, basically, my mom was driving. I was with my brother, and I was not driving myself. My mom was driving, and I was just try- trying to not make her sleep which is hard thing to do. We spent, first of all, like around the day on the border because, well, basically first three months of the war, we spent with my relatives in the Carpathian Mountains. This was actually the time I read 60 books within 100 mm. days, just wow. because I was very like bored and I was very like yeah. stressed. So I needed to like occupy my mind with something that is not happening in my life, but mm-hmm. happens in the books. So this is a very... That secret, how to read a lot of books. <laughs> like when you're just stressed, this is what you do. Yeah. And after that, we just we just needed to make a decision, like what we're gonna do, because nothing was getting really better, and we should either go back home to Kiev or go abroad. And we just saw that we can always come back, and we just tried our luck in UK because we have like family friends uh in uh england that's why we chose england and because of the freedom of speech because we can like basically easily communicate with people because our english is decent and yeah so driving 200 miles 2000 miles sorry uh back to the question well we we made breaks every yeah. like 8 hours sort of we you always like had sleepovers in germany in belgium in france no in france we didn't um in uh, austria so you make like one country they sort of Mm -hmm. (laughs) like you you make country you put you go to like capital city sort of and like sleepover then you drive another day so within like a week we get into like manchester but it was just long you don't really feel how time spends as soon as you're driving. 
because you're making like breaks it's not that hard to do but just that the concept of like you have one car in which you need to like fit in all the stuff you have yeah and you just leave the country with like a couple of like suitcases that you fit into your bag so you at least can like have something to change for like this is just like a decision you need to make and responsibility you need to take like how you're gonna like survive out there if you don't have anything mm. besides like yourself and your knowledge sort of and it was just long it was yeah. just a long travel that was uncomfortable and some extent i saw some like words landscape which was interesting because i was traveling and i was still trying to like find positive things in it because i was like oh i never been to belgium <laughs> no this is really how you react you're like i never been to belgium this is very interesting yeah. i never drive i never like been there on the car <laughs> so like i can see what's going on and <laughs> you and i was like there is some skyscrapers i never see this kind of skyscrapers in ukraine or like some electric stations when you drive through like you're just trying to be optimistic yeah. you're trying to get coffee eat mcdonald's you're just trying to laugh and you're trying to like minimize the conversation about the future this is something mm. like it's very tough on you because you like you don't know what to answer on that you just like have a destination for tomorrow and you'll see what you're gonna be like mm. in a month or in a week but thanks to our friends in England, we like established basic life near the Manchester for a short while, and then starting adapting to the UK. But I think to some extent, we're very lucky that we have friends that we have support and that uh, we basically could have like get out of Ukraine uh, yeah. alive. Because uh, I I really have a story when like there was a lot of like groups in um, Ukraine, in cities of, like, citizens, civilians, who were trying to, like, protect Kiev, because there was, on the first two, three days, like, basically the some sort of, like, groups from Russia, they reached out to Kiev. And I have a friend, Richerly, who lives, used to live in, like, uh, just Bucha, just near the Kiev. There are a lot mm -hmm. of things that were going on there. And it's like a village, let's say. And he was actually like make, making like the Molotov cocktail with his family. Really? This is really. And he in, he's sending the pictures to me and he's laughing about it. Like, this is how <laughs> we are. We're just like panicking, but trying to make sure no one is panicking around us. Yeah. Like, there was also a video out there where like a man stole Russian tank with his tractor. Like, if you will find it, you shall really add it okay. to the video. <laughs> but But this is like literally how Ukrainians were fighting because we didn't have our weapons like yeah. to the full extent. So we're just trying to like do whatever we can. Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it's like hysterical love because like I don't really understand how we had this kind of a bravery to like go through this event. But like, for example, from my balcony, I saw like when I was at mom's, mom's place for three days, I saw how like... She was trying to get rid of the rubbish because we needed to like clean up the place a bit. And there was like some civilians out there who was like checking everyone's IDs. Like, mm -hmm. where are you doing? What are you doing? And like, it's a bit scary because my mom told me like that you have a like man with a gun pointing at you and you need to show them your IDs. Because like it was the first two, three days of the war and people were just getting mad. They didn't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they catch like a spy sort of near our house uh in kiev as well a spy for russia sure so like it's like not i would not say that like a spy that you imagine from movies but mm. like there was like small groups who reached kiev and like they were like just separated so they catch like person and they were like making like sort of mm. I don't even know how to say it in English, but like they were trying to ask him questions, yeah. but in a rude way. <laughs> and um, it was all happening in the like kindergarten um, garden. So there was a kin not like kindergarten, but like 
play where kids were playing all the time with mm -hmm. swings and stuff yeah with small garden and there was happening right there and i saw it from like my balcony wow and like at the same time you're trying to be like okay that's fine but at the same time you're just you cannot really fully understand yeah. that like so you ended up leaving like your home in, in Kiev three days after the around three four days um and we gone to Carpathian's mountains okay for two three months around this time and then in May we moved to to England mm. so you were you were in Kiev for part of the time when like the Russian forces were trying to take mm -hmm. control because it was impossible to get out of the city like first hours people were just trying to buy petrol yeah and that's it like at the same time uh like grocery shops like it sometimes looked like apocalypses because people were just like rushing into the stores get food mm. get petrol at least with, like we've, we didn't struggle with the food i'm very happy about that but there was like struggles with petrol so even when we were like going to carpathians in every gas station you cannot get more than like i don't know 20 percent of your like um storage in the car i'm not really remembering like letters but you could not really get like enough to get the full way so you needed to stop every on every gas station to get like a bit more of the gas yeah or petrol because like it was a huge shortage of it and on the border there was like some people who like were staying for like 24 hours for 48 hours to get out of the country yeah and just because of that my family decided to like stay for a short while at least in the carpathians until all this like huge move like a bit gets more peaceful yeah. so you can like at least not spend two days on the border mm -hmm. so better spend it at home but yeah were you not at all like worried that um like did you i don't know how to ask this in a good way but were you not at home worried that like your home might get like blown up well or you were in kiev i mean even when one of my dachas yeah maybe this guy's my one of my countries and house is fully destroyed so even on that news you like you cannot really react you're like okay i'm not gonna see this house anymore great like it just mm. you you cannot really like explain that and like go through it of course i was sad but this sadness usually goes over time like it comes over time and goes over time so there is no such a like point of like yeah i understand it fully i'm like crying i'm into tears i'm like i don't know i need some antidepressants to like calm down it's it's not really for some people probably not for me and not for a lot of people who i know yeah you're just trying to like keep up with the reality but at the same time not trying to go mad from the reality yeah so i would say just over long period of time you like understand it and you cry about it and you like get this like wave of emotions but not during like first wave like you just it just comes over time and mm -hmm. then it goes over a long time Mm -hmm. yeah. was your um what were you in, in, in what were you doing like career-wise at the time were you in school were you um, i was doing both i was studying and working at the same time because mm -hmm. i got my first internship when i was 15. so i started working in marketing at that time as well and i was doing my school at the same time as studying so at that time i was finishing my school and school wise it was like sort of not that hard for me because i switched my school that i was studying for like 11 10 10 11 years because in ukraine there's only 11 years of school mm -hmm. and i switched it be like two months before prior to the war the full-scale invasion uh because i couldn't put, like combine it with full-time work because i was full-time working and full-time studying yeah i just decided to go to like uh, self-learning 
mm-hmm. with exams, but without like school attendance. And like for me, it didn't really change anything in school routine because I was still studying online and like submitting everything online and I had only exams. Mm-hmm. But I know for my classmates who I like speak to this day, they are still like, it was like great in school. So first of all, like first couple of days, no one like, got out of the house. Yeah. Second of all, a lot of people were studying in basements because as soon as like alarm goes down, you just need to go to the basement. But first mm-hmm. like few months, it was like multiple times a day like 10, 15 times a day. And like there was a special place for like school so you can you can study in the basement all the time. Career-wise, it was a break for me. I think that's why I was, I was reading a lot because um, like all the projects I was working on, like they, they frozen for like some while. Mm. And I think only four or five months after the full-scale invasion some of them restart but at the same time like economically wise ukraine struggled a little through the time because like if you look at the current currency exchange rates as well you can see how like prices increases but salaries decreasing sort of so career wise it was a huge break and i think i started working fully only after i moved from Manchester from near Manchester to Edinburgh when I got fully back to my routine when I um, like got to university here and was freelancing here and then opened the company here so only after that I fully recovered in this case and I think my acceptance was sort of like going over time in terms of like me trying to occupy myself with sort of doing nothing. So in Carpathians, I was reading in Manchester for these two, three months. I was three months. I was um, doing my documents, BRPs, mm-hmm. uh, gym. I was doing gym two di- times a day, <laughs> two times a day because I was so stressed. I needed to gym two times a day. Yeah. And... I think this is the way I was trying to like survive to make like a break from everything and like understand it. Yeah. But I would the same time I would say I was just trying to prevent from understanding because you're trying to I was trying to occupy myself so I can like continue reading the news because it's it's very stressful because you have like news groups in Telegram. Do you know Telegram? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Not a lot of people know what is Telegram. I have Telegram. Okay. Swag. <laughs> yeah, so in Eastern Europe, it's very popular. And Telegram, you have a lot of, like, news groups. Yeah. And you, like, every hour, you get some pop-ups about, like, what's going on around, like, news in Ukraine, about everything. And it is stressful. So, like, first two, three months, you read about read, read them every single day, every single hour. Yeah. And over a period of time, you're just trying to like not to like mm. at least read global news because if you read like our news, you get the news every hour basically. Yeah, you can just get mad because if you really like understand what's going on, it's crazy. And at the same time, if you compare Russian news and Ukrainian news, it is like two different stories. Yeah, fully like even if you subscribe to like Russian news channels and Ukrainian channels like at the same time like back in the beginning of the full-scale invasion you would see the same situation described fully differently mm-hmm. so so do you do you follow like russian do you, do you look at I the russian to, news too i used to uh, <laughs> just because to compare i was really interested yeah. like what if people are using an excuse of like not understanding what's going on on being brainwashed or being like manipulated like let me see what's going on mm. because for example even my uh my brother's godfather godfather uh, and godmother basically great movie by the way i'm very co- I'm, yeah godfather <laughs> yeah godmother i'm always confusing them so they are living with their kids in russia but mm-hmm. we didn't talk with them for like 10 years or something after they moved there and all these things started happening, like a lot of people just changing their position very weirdly, even though they are like Ukrainians themselves. There is a lot of stories of people of people who like really don't understand what they are saying sometimes. So they say like stuff like 
like kind of more on the pro Russian side of things? They're more of a like, oh, we're not we like neutral, not pro Russian yeah. or pro Ukrainian, but just like we're trying to be silent and shut up and not say <laughs> anything because it's better not to like yeah. this kind of an attitude. Uh, some people are at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, being pro Russian as well, mm-hmm. even in like out of Russia or Ukraine, like in Eastern Europe countries. Mm. Sometimes uh, this has been very annoying. Yeah. Or like also being neutral. But, you know, as much as people they are on this planet, mm. it's this, this same amount of opinions we have about mm. subjects. So, I'm just talking from like a face of a citizen, not a politician or yeah. historical, like people who know everything from like political side of perspective. This is just my story and story of people who I know. And mm. I can only say on what I've seen. Um, so you, you mentioned like the kind of the, the Russians who are neutral because they're like, I don't want to say anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a difficult subject, right? Because even like in Edinburgh, I'll speak to the Russians and kind of off the record in private, they'll tell me, you know, they're very anti-Putin, anti-war, but um, they're very hesitant to like, you know, publicly go, even like go to a protest or publicly post anything online because they're worried about what would happen to them. Um and I've heard, I've also heard mixed reactions from people on the other side who are like, well, so what if they have to, you know, if they they could get in trouble with the government because we're at war, um, you know, that it's comparing like, so what if you lose your citizenship? We're at war. Where do you kind of stand on, on that issue of Russians who maybe internally they're against the war, but publicly or or in bigger settings, they just want to shut up because they're worried about what could happen. Well, in this case, I would just give an example of Maidan that was happening in Kiev, where basically unarmed citizens in central Kiev, just in central Kiev, near like monuments, they where is like Verkhovna Rada, which is like a uh, parliament mm-hmm. in UK, for example. So they were like basically unarmed, going to the parliament and like voting and protesting, sleeping on the streets for months in order to get the justice from the government, yeah. in order to like switch the government. And mm-hmm. there was basically like a small war in central Kiev between Ukrainian citizens and Ukrainian government. At the same time, where like alarmed weapons like army sorts of army were trying to like prevent citizens from coming to the like parliament and there a lot of people were shot Mm. like even though it's like central kiev just central kiev like situation so in my case i think like people have their right to do whatever they want but uh like why we are brave enough to like fight for our own victory or for like changing our own government like Mm. we can do that why you can't like we even if we can like why you can't like this Mm -hmm. is just something that always like i got in my mind when someone asked this kind of question yeah but like in ukraine there was like actually like military soldiers who were like killing people on the streets yeah and in Russia, I saw some videos from protests where, like, there was like some group of protests when just in the beginning, and there was like one um, one policeman who yeah. was running after them, and all the group were just like running away. Sort of some videos of them. Yeah, like it's just people are scared of being imprisoned, and I understand that to some extent, but at the same time. Like, I think everything is being understood in comparisons. So this is a comparisons I make in yeah. my case. I mean, it's, it's it's difficult for me, right? Because I'm from the US where we have, in terms of like countries that have rights and whatever, we can say whatever we want to a mm-hmm. large extent and we can protest and do it all kinds. I mean, what's happening at the universities now, like 
Yeah, freedom of speech. We have, so I've never had, like, I mean, I have a podcast. I've never had that, like, oh, crap, I shouldn't, you know. I mean, there is, like, oh, maybe this company won't hire me or if I say something controversial online or maybe they'll think of me differently. But in terms of, like, prison or life or death, it's never been uh, a thought process in my head. So it's harder, I think, for me to kind of understand how um, saying something like that could lead to, like, prison or... Um, but, but I mean, you, you raise an interesting point. It's like, well, if Ukrainians are willing to do it, why can't Russians? Well, as I mentioned before, but briefly, like, I was recently reading the book which basically says the power of the powerless, which basically teaches us by like how by telling the truth we can like stand by our point. Mm -hmm. This is basically the book by the first president of Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And um, this, I think this is something that really correlates with the situation right now happening in Ukraine in terms of like full scale invasion and the way people while they're trying to like normalize what's going on yeah like as the same as was in Czechoslovakia when people were like yeah but it could be worse or concept of like in Russia as well of like normalizing what's going on because of feeling like powerless so if you like look in the history back there like just in my concept I think like if other countries could do that why can't you like at the same case mm -hmm. of like I'm not sure whether you watched like the interview of the like Putin when which which he was doing with uh, yeah Tucker Carlson yeah, yeah yeah I did see that one and I, I just saw like some moments of the video where he basically like sort of said that like Austria and Czechia they were like oh this they are like this is their fault that they were like sort of like invaded like there was like mm -hmm. sort of hints like that and uh, like that they couldn't protect themselves stuff like that so like I don't really understand how like people can really like follow this kind of thoughts like mm -hmm. in i just don't understand so before world war ii poland collaborated with hitler and although it did not yield to hitler's demands it still participated in the partitioning of czechoslovakia together with hitler as the poles had not given the Danzig corridor to germany and went so far pushing hitler to start world war ii by attacking them why was it poland against whom the war started on 1st september 1939 Poland turned out to be uncompromising, and Hitler had nothing to do but start implementing his plans with Poland. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about, <laughs> like, uh, I mean, because you mentioned you you follow some, you used to follow some Russian media to see the propaganda. You mentioned you watched clips of the Putin interview. One of the things he says a lot, and which is in a lot of like Russian official documents, is that. Ukraine and Belarus are part of the, the Russian world, the Ruski Mir, right? And he uses that to kind of justify, oh, Ukraine and Belarus are part of, you can't separate them from Russia. I think to people who don't know history, don't know, I mean, I have to be honest, most people in the US don't even know that Ukrainian is a separate language. Sometimes that would happen. It used to happen at least, not before the full scale invasion, but not anymore. I, I, I like, luckily, I didn't really get these questions anymore. Because mm -hmm. if I would, I would be very pissed. But like, I used to, I used to have these questions like, oh, this is like different languages. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's actually different. Like, the con like, what really surprises me that people don't really understand that, like, for example, you, all Ukrainians, we speak Russian, we know the Russian yeah. perfectly. But almost no. Russians understand Ukrainian. So if I would start speaking in Ukrainian to Russians, they would mm -hmm. understand like some words because yeah. there is a concept of like surzik, which is like combination of two languages yeah. because of their like ethnicity and background and all the things that happened. But overall, it's two different languages and yeah. you cannot compare them. Like it's like Polish and Ukrainian as well. Like it's, it's totally mm -hmm. different. Like 
Yeah. Sorry, you were asking something. I I moved from the topic. Well, well the point was, I mean, you kind of. Would, the point is, like, I think the the layperson, right? They hear that and they're like, oh well, you know, culture is kind of similar. They're bordering both parts of the the USSR. Um, on paper, their languages look similar. Uh, you know, people look kind of similar. Um, you know, I don't understand why that's wrong. I mean, so do you have any, can you help to kind of, <laughs> uh, that type of person understand why Ukraine, like why Ukraine does not belong to Russia? I mean, now that's kind of a, it's so, it's such a weird question because you wouldn't ask any other nation yeah. to justify, like, <laughs> why? Why, why, why you deserve to be like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> like, but, Unfortunately, right, because that comes out of the Russian propaganda so frequently. I think, uh, <laughs> I don't really know how to even compare it, but like, for example, recently UK separated from the European Union. Like, right. Well, you cannot really say now that they are belong to European Union, but like, I think Soviet Union, European Union is the same sort of concept when they like countries separated. It was like that combination of uh, independent countries in the beginning. Yeah. Like there was not the fact of like Ukraine was part of Russia. And then it one day they were like, no, this part <laughs> is ours. This is the border. You don't go there. Like. In the beginning, Ukraine was an independent country right. that joined as all other countries as Kazakhstan, etc. Like they joined the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union separated, Ukraine as well separated from Soviet Union. It doesn't have any relation to Russia. It's the same to say, like, oh, that Kazakhstan owned Ukraine or Ukraine owned right. Kazakhstan. Right. Like it's just it just doesn't make sense. Like it's the same as like US looks like like separate not only continent but like we have European Union we have uh, like US and we ha you had Soviet Union sort right. of. so when they separated like the countries that were independent they still are independent and just because Ukrainian fields are like recognized are like Ukrainian basically is a good business you have a good fields you can like grow agriculture and I think one of the reasons why Russia is like so precise with that because they can like double the income sort of right. from that and uh, just because of someone saying like it's theirs it's not gonna become theirs right. like you know right. it, it is it is very weird like it's the same if you would like give me the microphone and I would say like now it's mine thank you <laughs> I, I touched it, you know, I like met you and now like I I'm have a right to steal what you have. Yeah. No, I, and I think... Did you actually know that during like Soviet Union times and past times, why people like all know Russian is just because all skills, theaters, everything was like forbidden to be like shown or spoken in Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. So basically you could, you can be and you will, would be imprisoned if you like write in Ukrainian, mm. like for example, famous authors like, I don't know, Taras Shevchenko, uh, one of the like famous writers in Ukraine, like he was imprisoned for the fact of like writing in Ukrainian. Yeah. Because it was forbidden by the government. Mm. I mean, that's why, I mean, I guess the comparison is like why so much of Latin America speaks Spanish. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were just, they were colonized and they were like yeah. forced to speak. Spanish, um, that doesn't make them, that doesn't mean they belong to, to it, yeah. Um, and I think too, like, especially in Europe, the borders of countries have changed so much over history. And, you know, you could point to so many countries. I mean, Turkey is a big one where I'm like, well, a lot of it should belong to Greece. Um, but, okay. you know, there's, um, and another one is like Northern Macedonia, you know, there's a whole thing with Bulgaria. And um, so I think, you know, there's so many borders that have changed our history in Europe and the way the size of the countries and the way they've been. But I think the problem is, right, like if you keep on trying to like, we're at a certain point now where the borders are the way they are. And the countries have a sovereign nation. And we're not gonna. We're just gonna have constant war if 
we're just going to like dispute those borders. Like at a certain point, we have to say, okay, these are the borders. This is the way it is. You know, let's respect each other's autonomy. Um, I think just the point, like we have a saying in in Eastern Europe and Ukraine as well, like that the history doesn't judge the winners. And I guess because of this sort of like establishment in world basically history and like mentality, like people forget things over time. Well, if we have a look, there's almost no country in the world who have never been on the war and whose territory yeah. was not occupied or like s- separated or like changed, right? right? Exactly. So that's why I think what you're saying is quite right, but to the same extent, like one of the like pro-Russian thought is like Ukraine is a territory, but Ukraine is a country. Like we have a very interesting like grammar point. For example, we say Ukraina mm-hmm. and some Russians say Ukraina just okay. because of like, and the same is like, you cannot say the Ukraine because therefore territory. But sometimes you even see it in the news or like for Russian sort of like um, newspapers or debates, like this is wrong because Ukraine is not the territory, it's country. Right. This is like a concept of like sharing the territory. Mm-hmm. It's just a bit different, I think, in this case. And there is a lot of like pro-Russian grammar or like news or thoughts that you sometimes use you don't even know that it's this just like it's more understandable if you like speak ukrainian i would explain this to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but it's just a grammar point the way you like put the spelling or like uh the way you spell some words or like do you use the with them or a like a or like n sort of with mm-hmm. them it's just the case yeah the the, the history lesson <laughs> i i enjoy it i'm <laughs> I've I've actually been trying to get somebody to like sit down with me and teach me all the history. Uh, well, you have your father; he speaks Russian, right? Yeah, but I mean, he's not like native. Yeah, but like he can. If you learn Russian, you're gonna be easier to learn Ukrainian as well. And yeah, and at the same time, uh, if you would learn Ukrainian, you would mostly be easier to understand Russian as well. Mm-hmm. So you can try to learn it, and you have someone to teach you. Yeah. Um, one day. Uh, okay, so obviously the war is happening right now. I mean, no shit, right? Like, but, and I think, would you, I mean, I think the goal, right, is, what? Well, what is the goal for Ukraine? Get back to normal. We Get didn't really to touch normal. anyone. We didn't really want anything. So, well, ideal option, of course, is going to get back all our territories, including Crimea. Right. But uh, this this is the goal, and I think it always will be. And I think if it would be any, like, realistically speaking, like, way of getting the peace with agreement, they would already get it over this long period of time. Because I think... No one really said what conditions were like suggested by Russian or by Ukrainians because you don't have the publicly like cited the conversation right. of the leaders. But at the same time, I think if there would be any like possible way of ending the war with an agreement, the countries would already like sign it for it. Because like I don't think that, and I'm not ready to like give up our territory for what for like for it to like happen again in a couple of years, mm-hmm. like. This is this is the goal. <laughs> get yeah. back, get back our territories back, and grow our economy to the level it was before. Because as I mentioned, like exchange rates, for example, before Crimea and the Donetsk like war, it was like for example, dollar dollar exchange rate was around like eight. Yeah. Then it was sixteen. Now it's forty. Wow. Like in comparisons to pounds is like Ukrainian hryvnia is like around like. 1 to 50, mm. which is like huge. In, ter- in terms of, this is this is where there's a disconnect, right? Between people who are, are, are from Ukraine, who like have an emotional connection to the country and people like who are just kind of looking at it from a distance and saying, okay, where is the war now? What is the territory gains? What's the possibility of 
um, you know, a heart is not in it in the same way that, that your heart is in it. Um, but I, I mean, I, you hear most commentators and they say, well, the only way for this to end is some kind of off ramp where like fighting stops, Russia takes the Donbass, you know, the rest of Ukraine joins NATO, um, and you know, the Russia pays a certain amount to Ukraine to help rebuild like Mariupol and the other cities. What what to you would be the realistic I don't know. I, this is so hard because again, for you, right? You don't want to lose any territory. You don't want to give up defeat. But, um, well, okay. Is there any way that you would be okay with this ending without regaining the territory that you've lost or all the territory that you've lost? I think. Well, I truly think that I, I'm not really the one to charge on like the best possible outcome or like the comfortable outcome because uh, I don't have the right to judge on that. Like mm -hmm. I'm just a citizen. I'm not the politician. I'm not the leader to like judge on what's going to be best for us long term because there is drawbacks and flaws and advan like advantages of all the outcomes we can have a look on. Mm -hmm. And... Even even if we like if even if the war stops tomorrow, there will be a lot of disbalance yet, mm -hmm. and it would take ages to not only rebuild but like economically stabilize Ukraine. But at the same time, even if it would be fully like protected by NATO, it's also controversial because like they could have like closed the sky over Ukraine a long while ago already, so mm -hmm. we would not have the like missiles over Ukraine. Yeah. To the state. So, unfortunately, I think in this world you can only like rely on yourself fully and yeah. like hope for the best for support from external mm -hmm. forces. So, I don't. I cannot answer on the outcome what would be satisfying for me to like end the world with because it's from the first point it, there is no like satisfying outcome already. Yeah, and best outcome. I don't really know. I think those who are in like the most suffered regions, they just want it to end. And they don't really, they don't really care how already. But I think there will be consequences even if it ends tomorrow with with our territories back or without. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's that's obviously not an easy question, uh, and there's no right or wrong answer to it. Um, but I appreciate you putting up with putting up with me. I'm just trying to, yeah. Um, I want to move now toward uh, like a difficult conversation um, because I think this is going to actually help a lot of people uh, support. Like, I think the from what I kind of am hearing on different news channels, the people that are uh, skeptical of Ukraine is the people who feel like the way it's being portrayed in the media is like this beacon of paradise in terms of like um, there's no problems in the country, meaning outside of the war, right? Uh, and I think that that bothers them a little bit because uh, it kind of makes them feel like they're being lied to and they feel like, well, if you're not telling us the truth about this, then it, you know what other things are not true. So I think, I think it would be helpful to talk about a little bit of some of the kind of internal uh, problems that Ukraine has faced or kind of is facing beyond just the the war now. Is that okay with you? Sure. So, um, this in mind, uh, I guess the first question is, what before the war, what were the main problems that people of Ukraine were facing? Um, like just, you know, in Kiev, in 
what was kind of the, the when people were thinking, oh, what are the main problems that we have to deal with, that we have to face? What were they? Well, I think before the war, there was, there was lack, actually, there was truly really lack of like Ukrainian identity in the daily routine. So, for example, in Kiev, almost 70% of people were talking on Russian on daily. So, like, you would hear Russian language out there more often than you would hear Ukrainian. So, luckily, like, my school, it was, like, teaching in Ukrainian. But before the war, some schools were, like, teaching in Russian as well. Mm -hmm. So, like, like, Ukrainian was, like, a language you would learn. But at the same time, like, lectures, your lectures would speak in Russian to you. And, like, this is just in its core is very wrong like yeah. because it's just like sort of soviet union mindset that we're still sometimes in some schools around ukraine like in kiev it was more like ukrainian like ukrainianized and after the war around like 90 percent of people speak like ukrainian only like yeah. especially in public spaces so like people truly are like understanding these cultural differences mm -hmm. and they're like understand that even like small things in daily routine that you do it's essential to still like do it in Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And uh, also one of the things that I particularly like saw this is unfortunately the corruption that was much more spread before the war. Um, like it was basically one of the reasons why we all the time were very unsatisfied with our, our government, government because we have like a huge stock of finances who would be like, who would we get from agriculture, for example, from like expert, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we would not really get them into like renovation of the country. Yeah. It would just get to someone's pocket. So that's why we would have such a thing as a Maidan. Like Maidan is just like bigger thing where it was related to the war itself as well. But generally speaking, why we had like a change of our presidents. And why we're not happy about our presidents just because of this point, mm -hmm. quite often. But because of the war, I think that Ukrainian nationality, nation itself, they we just became more united. Yeah. And this like sense core of values, it just it just changed. So like you treat a lot of things differently now, and you you just understand what is important. Well, one of the other things that I would mention is like uh, how we are relying on the external support. So that we we gave up all our weapons back then, then for like supervision of other countries. But at the same time, when we actually need them, we cannot like get them. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things that like atomic weapons and bombs, like one of the <laughs> scientists who was working like closely with Oppenheimer was Ukrainian scientist. I I got to know really? that recently. Yeah. I was I was really surprised. I was like, <laughs> okay, so. Right, where is where is the like truth in it right now? Why don't we? Why can't we get access to something we actually created, sort of mm -hmm. in like color col collaboration, but sort of anyway. So a lot of things like that. Uh, so rely relying on external support. I think this is a lesson we learned and the mistake we won't do again because I think every country there. First of all, for them is their will be. They're not gonna sacrifice their relationships right. and their will be for other countries. So I think uh, our dependency is something that was mm. that the lesson we learned more during these times. And at the same time, uh, the way that we basically sell all our sources we like gather you export yeah a lot so we export a lot i think every i think generally speaking we should more focus on like internal development mm -hmm. rather than only on selling and exporting it mm. so it's national identity yeah which it seems like ironically <laughs> the war is fixing yeah um corruption yeah which do you think has, has gotten better I think it did, especially during like first year, it got much better. Mm -hmm. Like after that, there started to be some ins and outs and conversation about it again. But I don't think that I have the right to prove it or disprove it because I don't know. But at the same time, I think overall it got better because a lot of people right now, they're doing, for example, private fundraisings. 
Yeah. So like, we not only like donate to like the main funds of Ukraine, but we also like do the private donations with all the reports. And like a lot of people just spend money on the needs of like our armed uh, forces. Yeah. Like buying cars, weapons, tents, etc. Anything they need. Uh, but give it directly to the like armed groups, not to the government, which right. also like sort of, I don't know, security behind the corruption. But overall, I would say it get much better. Okay. And then the third one was reliance on external. Yeah. Well, I think we cannot get rid of it right now. <laughs> way. So uh, I think it's just uh, something we would hopefully adapt in our business model yeah in the future cool cool okay and in one of your many uh accomplishments you were featured in australian vogue <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah and uh during the interview which i read which you should all read um you said that zelensky is the best president ukraine has ever had yeah i did do you stand by that <sighs> Well, when I said it, it was only like first months after the beginning of the war. And I think what a lot of Ukrainians appreciated that it was the first president who didn't run out of the country, like mm -hmm. after some shit started going on. Like it was actually the first president who was like, no, I'm staying, I'm here. Because like there was a situation when the US like suggested him to get the helicopter for him and his family yeah. to go like to America or to Europe. And he said, like, I don't need an Uber. I need, like, some ways to protect myself yeah. in my country. So, like, I think this is something that, like, conquered a lot of hearts of Ukrainians. Yeah. And I think a lot of people know about that. But, like, Zelensky himself, he used to, like, be an actor. Like, yes. This is how he actually, like, got the voting because Ukraine wanted a president who would be representative of the nation yeah. itself. And by standing, whether he's the best president or not, when I said it, it was more of an emotional answer. Right now, I think <laughs> there are always ins and outs, and people always need someone to blame. And I think so far, uh, he's much a better choice that we could get during these circumstances. Mm -hmm. I cannot judge whether it is the best for entire history, but I think uh his decisions and his support and his way of building international relationships is very beneficial for all of us and we should appreciate that mm. well i appreciate the honest answer <laughs> um okay do you think i mean we talked about this before but so as i understand and correct me if i'm wrong that there is some differences between western ukraine and eastern ukraine mm -hmm. uh in terms of like Western Ukraine, the Ukrainian language is stronger. We talked about, you know, yeah. the the maybe the sense of nationalism is a little bit stronger in the West. Do you do you th we talk about the the fight of national identity? But do you think that Ukraine right now is united? Well, as they say, struggles like unite people. So I would say yes, and without hesitation, mm -hmm. much more than we used to. Like, yeah. do you think it'll stay that way? Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> um, I really hope so. What I think that even if I have a lot of friends abroad, and what I see that I can always count on them doesn't matter for how long time we didn't catch up like we cannot call each other for years really for years but like if someone would be coming into the city or country or they would need some help we would always be like sure what do you need like and i would say this kind of like lesson and struggle helps us to be more united and i really hope that it will be like that mm -hmm. term. what is Excluding the war in the sense of struggle, what is something that has united? What is something that unites all Ukrainians? 
think there is not one thing that I can mention. Like, it's generally what unites every nation. Like, mm -hmm. if you have a look at any nation, we all have the same factors of being united, like language, culture, fasts, economy, mentality, etc. Like, I think all these things and... In our case, I think just war just gave it the boost. But if we don't consider it, uh, generally speaking, I think mentality of Eastern Europe and Ukraine especially is like just unique itself. Like mm -hmm. we are very like straightforward and we are like very helpful, as I mentioned. Like we really cannot speak to someone for years and then like be okay with helping them out or like seeing them like as this time didn't pass. So... I think this what really makes us united as well, like the similarities and the fact that when we like saw the outward, like we were in our bubble thinking that everything is okay and sometimes thinking it was like, oh, shall I go to US and get like to the university in America or Miami? <laughs> yeah, like how cool it would be to get like a scholarship and like move to Miami, etc. But actually when you move out there, there is a lot of stories of people who are like, I don't feel like at home because people don't understand me. Like, even if though I speak the language, it's not the same. So yeah. I think the fact that a lot of people moved out, they like united even more because they like started valuing. So there is a saying like you value only something that you already lost mm -hmm. to the most possible extent. So I think in this case, that also, also unites us. Like just the mentality. Yeah. Maybe this is a, uh, an obvious question, but do you hypothetically want to return and, and live in Ukraine? Uh, of course, but I'm not sure about living only in Ukraine because I understand, realistically speaking, how long time it's going to take to like to get back to financially, emotionally, basically, position in society and within the nation. nation like to the extent it was before the war. So I would definitely leave two countries probably. Uh, I would spend a lot of time back home for her because mm. uh, I really miss home. But at the same time, I would I would travel more and I would probably have like living abroad as well. Yeah. Just because I'm sort of used to it more right now in terms of like work because I'm mainly working on the Western market right now. Um. And I think sort of like this limit of being only one country, I just crossed it already. So I think I will just try to like combine live in two countries. But definitely I really miss Ukraine. And you actually like all of you should visit that. You would get surprised how like relatively cheap you can like get stuff there. Where where should they go in Ukraine? There's a lot of amazing places to go. Like Kiev, of course, Odessa, Lviv. Like, Lviv itself looks like Austria. Really? But based on the architecture, yeah. So, visit the capital cities. If you want to get some history, there is the Chernobyl as well. Or you can visit Mariupol mm. after the war. Hopefully, there will be left something to see there. But there is, there is a great, lot of great places. We have as we call it, like, Bingsi, with high level of salt there that was just near the Crimea there. So we what used to have it. So it's, the, it's like a sea that has a huge, like, salt percentage in oh, it. Oh, it's like the Dead Sea. Yeah, sort of. But, like, there is also, like, some places when on the sunset it looks pink. Mm. So, like, I don't really remember how is it called, especially how to translate it into English. But a lot of my friends been there, and yeah. it looks fantastic. Mm. It looks really amazing. But you can drop me a text on Instagram. I can send you the places. <laughs> there, there is a lot of things to see. Do you think there's anything that um, people in the UK, US, the West misunderstand about Ukrainians? I think one of the biggest misconceptions is like sometimes when people talk to me, they don't really understand the concept of like a refugee sometimes mm -hmm. because there is some parts of refugees who actually lost their homes their income like everything and they are fully dependent in the countries they are living right now for example they are living in like 
social housing or something. And some people who moved not from the financial need, but from the sake of like, I just want to be safe and I don't want to like die back home. And the thing is that like, we're, we're the same people as you are and we have the same intellect and IQ and differences in traditions. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, we don't, we are not like, I don't know, people from Antarctic or whatever. <laughs> so we are so different. So you like don't yeah. understand us. I think this like barrier of understanding of having like a picture of like a refugee as someone who's like, um, I don't know, uh, ripped clothing. It's it's something that sometimes is very hard to understand for people because sometimes like if you have a look on the like, for example, cars that Ukrainians come out, there could be like a Mercedes or like BMW or like whatever. And some people just don't understand, like, why did you come here if you have like all this? Like, it's just not the concept of like being ranks to riches. Mm -hmm. It's just the concept of like being safe and trying to build up a new world here with like zero, with scratch in terms of like knowing the country. So basically our intellect and what we do, it's still with us. We just need time to rebuild it here. So it takes time. And a lot of people don't understand this, mm. you know, hopefully. Interesting. Do you, uh, do you, do you love Ukraine? Of course. Of course. Yes. I think almost everyone loves their homeland, no? Well, almost everyone. And I would never voluntarily think move to another country if I would not if, if not of the circumstances. Like I was not planning to. So Is there anything in the UK or in Edinburgh that helps you stay connected or, or feel close to like Ukraine even when you're abroad? There's actually some restaurants that already were opened by Ukrainians. There is like sushi place called Miu Miu, like something like that, if I'm right. But it's sushi restaurant opened in Edinburgh recently. There is sushi? Enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is there is some actually other places as well. Uh, when I was in Europe and I was in Austria, I was surprised how much of Ukrainian places are there. There is literally a place called Odessa, like, resta like restaurant Odessa. Really? In Austria. So I think a lot of Ukrainians, while moving out, they're also taking a piece of like identity. Now it's spreading more like mm -hmm. worldwide on the recognition level. But what I really do miss and what is lacking is the mentality. Like there is not that much of a people who would, would be the Ukrainians I would usually talk back on. So like, I'm not sure whether you have the same thing or not but like when you move to another country sometimes when you met like people from your homeland as well mm -hmm. people think you're gonna be best friends just because you're from the same country but it's not the way it works yeah yeah so uh i think what really likes me is this kind of like a mentality where you go out and you know everyone so like in kiev i could go out even though there is four million people i would always meet someone who i know mm. really like it just works this way and here it's not like just because my character is a bit different to the character that people used to like have here which and is i'm more very straightforward i don't like bullshit like i don't like <laughs> i really don't like it so i when someone is like giving me something i understand it's a lie i just i'm gonna tolerate i'm gonna be like look this is not true like you're just overreacting or like if someone would ask me my opinion on something, I would not be like, sure, this is something you need if it's a lie. Like, I would just say, like, nah, it's not, it's bad. Like, make it different. Mm -hmm. I would just give my honest opinion. And people here know that used to this kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. And for me, it is hard to adapt to it. That's why I also have a lot of international friends, some Scottish friends as well, a lot of family friends from Scotland who are like older. But at the same time, 
I, for example, don't get along with my university friends, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost. Like, there's some exceptions. But I just don't because I usually, like, do things in advance. I plan in advance. I know what I'm going to do. And when, like, I speak to people who don't know this, I just don't see the point sometimes. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's... Is that specifically a, a Scottish to Ukrainian thing, or is that more you're just like uniquely hardworking and? I I don't think it's uniquely because it's something I I heard from a lot of friends of mine who say that they don't get along with like uh, people of the same age, for example. That's why I have a lot of friends who are older, mm-hmm. like a friend friends over thirty, like and for me it's comfortable age. <laughs> of my friends yeah and uh that's why i'm friends with a lot of my fa- mom's friends for example like mm-hmm. when we have like family friends dinner i'm always there because i really want to catch up with everyone so just the mentality mentality wise i think people here get mature later on and yeah. that's why sometimes you just don't get a lot of the values in this case with them uh, but at the same time I think Scotland is a good second home and mm-hmm. I think government here done a lot of things for Ukrainians to feel comfortable with their support so I'm very grateful for all that because I, I don't know what I would do if I would not have this kind of a support because you mm. have education, you have like explanation of how everything does work, you have Basically, I think Edinburgh is very friendly towards Ukrainians. Like, mm-hmm. they are very understandable and they are very supportive whenever yeah. there's, like, anything bad or negative about it. Or people are always very welcoming and, like, always want to, like, get to know how are you doing, how's it going, how are you adapting. So I think this is something that really, really flatters me and that I'm really glad there are still some good people in this world. Mm. Let me see if I have anything else. Okay. Um, Are you hopeful for the future of Ukraine and for your own life? Do you have hope? You know, there is a saying, like, if you think that you cannot handle it, just realize that not handling it is not an option. So, like, I think this is something I live and stand for. Like... Mm. I don't that the sort of like being hopeless to my mind and I, I always believe in the best and I always believe in the positive future and I'm trying not to think about the worst outcomes but hopes for best outcomes and do my best to be influence of a best outcome as much as I can. Mm, beautiful. Okay, well, we've we've uh, come to the end of the interview. So, Kate, I want to briefly uh, get your opinion, not your opinion, what am I saying? <laughs> your, uh, I want you to describe a little bit more in depth the uh, charity that you mentioned at the oh, very beginning yeah. um, to remind people, but also tell people a little bit more about w- what, where their money would be going to if they could choose to donate. Yeah. So basically, this is a charity organization that is called Tvori Dobro, which means create and make do good deeds. And this is a charity organization that is helping women and kids who suffered from the war in 2022, 2023, 24, and right now and the future. And they are making the fundraising for the needs of those who suffered from the war from uh, Eastern region, primarily for like kids and women, mainly for psychological support for those kids who are left without their parents because of the war. And they're making just like supplies of uh, medicine, psychological help, clothing, toys, etc. So basically, first need that you need. And we're going to probably left the link down below so you can have a look on their website or Instagram or social medias to like see their data yourself so you can be sure that there is like internationally recognized organization uh, also as sort of like giveaway we wanted to do 
in order to like stimulate people to donate. Uh, basically, kids, those kids I just mentioned before, they made like a small workshop where they like done some paintings and one of the paintings and done together. And there is a painting with like Ukrainian symbolics on it and the name of the organization with like Ukrainian flags and everything. Uh, like this kind of a size of the painting, but quite big. Uh, that uh, was taken from all the way on the car from Ukraine, Kiev to here. Wow. Yeah. So uh, we're going to be like giving it away for a random donation. So from all of the donations that were made, starting from today to like, let's say a month's time, uh, we'll just choose a donation that's going to uh, like based on the number system, which is going to choose a donation randomly and send the painting wherever, whenever you want. Mm. Uh, for you as uh, bonus can i can i just ask one is that because i have listeners that are kind of in all over the world all over the world so is that just for people that are in edinburgh no we can't we can uh, if this painting got from ukraine i'm sure we can deliver it to you anywhere <laughs> to the to <laughs> new york city of course um and and so this is this is just to clarify this is an organization that's helping women and children in Ukraine right now. Yeah. That seems like a noble cause. <laughs> well, I'll be very happy and the organization will be very happy if you're going to help with anything you can or want. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions as well in the comments. I will try to uh, reply on them if I'll, you have anything I'll, I'll left, put, I'll, by the I'll way. I'll link your uh, Instagram. And okay, yeah. Well, that's you're true. very happy to reach out and give me your opinion as well if you disagree with something, for example. Yeah, yeah. Please start a... Uh, uh, debate in the chat that boosts the engagement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, thank you very much for inviting. Yeah, us. thank you so much. This was this was uh, wonderful. Um, really appreciate you coming on, taking the time. I know all the questions and things to talk about were not super fun, but I, I really appreciate it. I just think it's very important to like to more people to understand it and i hope that at least like small podcast and my involvement and in it's gonna make at least one people to change their opinion and it's gonna be success already like in a positive way so i really hope that there are some people who get to know history of ukraine and the situation of ukraine more within this podcast well that is a great way to end it thank you so much kate <laughs> really appreciate it Subscribe, obviously, um, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.